Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our next Lunch and Learn. We are so excited today as part of Black History Month. We have Leganzi Kale. He is a 2003 graduate of Arkansas State University. He is the owner of KLEK um, 102.5 FM here in Jonesboro. He's got his degree from A State in radio, television, and general studies. Um, he also holds a master's in teaching and learning with technology from Ashford University. Um, last year during Black History Month, um, A State honored him as a living legend in, in recognition of an alumnus who's made a significant contribution to our community. Um, while he was at A-State, uh, we have to give a shout out to Alpha Phi Alpha because he was a member of that. And he also is currently an advisor um, for the fraternity. Um, he's originally from Helena, West Helena um, area, and he now resides in Arkansas. Um, and I'm going to throw it over to Leganzi now. And he's gonna talk about um, you know, the radio station and what a resource it's been in the community um, for minorities. Um, and it's really brought people together in Jonesboro, and we're very thankful for that. Welcome, Leganzi. Well, welcome, and I thank, uh, thank you for this opportunity, and uh, thank each and every one of you for tuning in. I see some people I recognize. Uh, starting off with my lovely wife, Pamela. I see my pastor, Dr. Greg Ota, uh, Dr. Sharice Jones-Branch, Dr. Lonnie Williams, Mr. Jim Porter, um, my FCC attorney, uh, Michael Richards, so, and I don't want to wait, take up too much time shouting out everybody, but I do appreciate each and every one of you for checking in. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Let me hit this share content screen and Zoom start broadcast. So now, okay, so now I'm trying to do this on my iPad. All right, so does everyone see, does everyone see uh, this PowerPoint? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so let's yeah. go ahead. All right, go ahead and get started. All right, so this is Lunch and Learn, and Amanda's already introduced me, so we can go ahead and get started. This is surreal. So if you look at the bottom where the arrows are, it says, the opinions provided in this presentation are the sole opinion of Leganzi Care and do not reflect the opinion of Arkansas State University, its employees, affiliates, or subsidiaries. Wow. I'm usually the one that's always given a disclaimer on the radio. So when I first got word of this and saw that, I'm like, this is weird. I'm actually the subject of a disclaimer. I'm not actually giving it, but I do understand the legalities and the purposes of it, but I just thought that was kind of neat. All right, so we're gonna talk about background on the importance of radio in the black community. And I just realized that on my iPad, this my PowerPoint kind of renders a little differently. So I apologize if the letters look a little jumbled. So black radio stations along with the black church were two of the main ways in which the black community got information. This is especially true during the civil rights movement of the 1960s. Black DJs had a lot of respect in the community. In fact, black DJs were actually in some communities put on the same platform as pastors as important in the community because when you went to either the black church or you listened to the, the black radio station, that's pretty much where you got your information that's where you got your news from. So that was very important to the black community, especially during that time. And the black DJs would pass on information on strategies to fight racism and to counter obstacles placed in front of the black communities. Some of the ways in which they would do this is they would send special coded messages during their shows to let the community know when and where the marches and protests would take place. And then one example was WENN. They actually had their own helicopter and the helicopter would fly around and would relay reports of where things were going on. They would let the listeners know where the police roadblocks were, where to go and where to avoid. In Birmingham, members of the black community would wait inside churches with their radios on. And when the DJ would play a particular song, especially a gospel song, that would be their cue to leave a church and they could begin marching. So again, just a couple examples of just how radio was an important source in the community. All right, so let's talk about some of the first black radio stations in the US. So I'm sure most of you are familiar with WDIA 1070 AM out of Memphis, Tennessee. It was the first radio station to be programmed for and by African-Americans. It launched in 1947, it was white owned and they started playing classical and country restroom music, but they didn't really have that many listeners. So, and a last ditch, ditch effort to save the station, 
they switched their format with, to blues and they would invite artists such as Rufus Thomas, B.B. King and Bobby Blue Bland to come on and their ratings shot up and they actually went to number one in the market and WDIA is still on the air to this day. WERD AM was in Atlanta, Georgia. This was the first radio station that was actually owned by African-Americans. They launched October 3rd, 1949, broadcasting on 8.60 a.m. Uh, the gentleman that bought it named was Jesse B. Blayton Sr. He was an accountant, bank president, and an Atlanta University professor, and he bought it for $50,000. It was located in the Prince Hall Masonic Temple, which also hosted the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. That was the organization that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. formed to help in his efforts during the Civil Rights Movement. He sold the station in 1968. It no longer exists. All right, so taking it to the state of Arkansas. KOKY was the first radio station in Arkansas that was owned and programmed towards African-Americans. The station was launched in the Little Rock area. It launched on October 8th, 1956. It originally started as an AM on 1440 with the tagline, the Greater Little Rock Ebony Station. It is still on the air to this day on 102.1. I actually know one of the DJs on that station went to high school with them. All right, so Jonesboro actually had a black radio DJ and this photo is courtesy of the African-American Cultural Center in Jonesboro, which we will give a tour of on the KLK Facebook on the 16th of this month. But I'll read the caption on the photo. It says, in May 1953, Alan Patterson, owner of KBTM, integrated the radio airways by hiring Johnny Tansley as Jonesboro's first black disc jockey. The 30-minute show aired at 5 p.m. Monday through Friday for the month of May. It was called Jive at 5, and Radio Land, the hours between 4 p.m. and 7 p.m. are prime listening hours, known as drive time. The theme song was Duke Ellington's Take the A Train. The show featured jazz and rhythm and blues. It was canceled for a lack of sponsors. Why I always tell people, please donate and please sponsor to help keep us on the air because we don't get it. We don't, we don't get to continue. All right. Telecommunications Act of 1956. This would actually be a watershed in radio history. This was signed into law February 8th, 1996 by President Bill Clinton. The law made significant changes to the radio and television industry. The biggest change it made was it actually removed a lot of the caps of the number of radio, television stations and newspapers you can own. There were actually caps. You can only own so many. Once those caps were removed, you saw the rise of Clear Channel, which is now iHeartRadio, iHeartMedia, and Cumulus. You will start to see them buy up radio stations all over the country. And this will lead to many stations, especially those owned by people of color, selling because they couldn't compete with these large companies and some of them saw the writing on the wall and instead of trying to fight them, they just sold out to them. And so that would begin this trend of less and less minority voices in broadcasting. And once these companies actually took over these stations, a lot of the local DJs, and this wasn't just at the minority station, this would be across the board, they would get laid off and replaced with syndicated programs. So you would basically have maybe hundreds of radio stations pretty much airing the exact same program at the exact same time. So now what? With the consolidation of the media landscape, lack of available frequencies and the high financial barriers to en entry, it made it very difficult to impossible for local voices, voices to be heard via traditional airways. If you were to actually try to buy a radio station these days, you would be looking at a minimum of six figures just to buy the station. That's not a counting hiring people, actually running it or managing it. And if you get into a city the size of Jonesboro, you can easily get into mid six figures and even seven figures. And if you get into like a major market, well, good luck with that. All right, so we fast forward to 2010. Enter the Local Community Radio Act of 2010. This was be the law that actually would help to make KLEK possible. The LCRA was signed into law on January 4th, 2011 by President Barack Obama after passing both houses of Congress in December 2010. The law would authorize the Federal Communications Commission to offer low power broadcast licenses, which is known as LPFM. The licenses, however, would only be available to nonprofit organizations, 
governments, schools, and Native American tribes. One of the things that the FCC wanted in this, they definitely wanted minority voices to be a part of this, and especially Native American tribes. The Native American tribes actually could apply for two stations, whereas everyone else could only apply for one station. So what is an LPFM? Low power FM stations broadcast at a maximum power of 100 watts, effective radiated power. That is actually the number of watts that actually come out of the antenna. Your average LPFM can broadcast a range of three to five miles, but can reach 10 to 20 miles, depending on terrain and obstructions in the path of the signal, such as trees, buildings, and even the signals of other radio stations. So like for KLEK, depending on which direction you go, it fits within that 10 to 20. 20 mile range. People always ask, how far does KLEK get out? So we get out about close to Harrisburg going south, to the edge of Paragould going north, to Bono going west, and between Truman and Marktree headed east. So our signal actually goes out a little further east, not as much west because on the western side of town, you, the, the terrain kind of goes up a little bit. And plus you actually have a 102.5 in West Plains, Missouri. That's a 50,000 watt station that kind of buffers our signal somewhat in the western part of Jonesboro. LPFMs are non-commercial. Even though you may listen to KLEK and you hear announcements that sound like commercials, they're actually called underwriting announcements. We are not allowed to broadcast full-blown commercials. And the best way to describe an underwriting announcement is an audio business card, which kind of tells who you are, what you have to offer, and the best way to contact you. An opportunity. With the passage of the LCRA, I saw an opportunity. Jonesboro had never had a radio station that exclusively played urban music, let alone owned by African Americans. So if you were Black and you lived in Jonesboro, I'm sure several of you on this call can attest to this. If you wanted to listen to the radio, you pretty much had to listen to a station out of Memphis, such as, as we mentioned earlier, WDIA or WHRK, which is K97 in Memphis. So during the summer of 2013, I began to research what would it take to actually apply for an LPFM construction permit. So before a station can be licensed, you actually have to apply for the permit to build the station. You don't just say, hey, I'm going to build a radio station and do it. You actually have to petition the FCC to do so. And that's when you get people like Attorney Richards involved in consulting engineers to make sure that all of your I's are dotted and your T's are crossed in the everything technically lines up because if not, your application can get thrown out on the smallest of technicalities. So with that being said, I had a goal, but could I do it? Recruiting a board to believe in a vision. Well, as I mentioned earlier, before you can even apply for LPFM, you have to have a nonprofit organization because that's what the FCC mandated that these low power stations actually be owned by a nonprofit organization. So while Amanda said that I am the owner of KLEK, technically that is not true. The owner of the radio station is the Voice of Arkansas Minority Advocacy, Advocacy, Advocacy Council, excuse me. It's a nonprofit that I did form, but I as an individual do not own the station. So this will be, recruiting a board is in, for this kind of endeavor is unique because it's not like a regular nonprofit where you recruit a board, they serve, and they give advice and direction on the organization. When the board members that I will recruit actually will have to put their name on the FCC license which means anything that KLEK does, they are just as responsible as I am for the content. So, you know, that's kind of a lot to ask of someone to put their name on a federal license. A daunting challenge. But we're going to find out how I actually did it. Upon the recommendation of my radio mentor, Mr. Raymond Sims, also a fellow A-State alumni who won the Arkansas State Living Legend Award, Mr. Lyle Lattimore would agree to serve on the first board of the Voice of Arkansas Minority Advocacy Council. I called Mr. Lattimore to introduce myself. We kind of had a few pleasantries and we met the next day for him to sign the paperwork. Now, what made this so special was the day that I met him was the first time I had ever really, other than that quick phone conversation, this my first interaction with him. And when I met him, he didn't say, well, what am I getting myself into? Can you explain this to me? He just simply said, where do I sign? And he signed a paper and he left. Sadly, Mr. Lattimore passed away October 6, 2016, but we at KLEK always honor and cherish his memory because again, I think that was just such a big deal for someone. Just upon the recommendation of someone 
to put enough trust and believe in the vision to sign his name on it. A chance encounter. Mr. Sims would also recommend Dr. Wilbert Gaines, one of the first black professors at Arkansas State and member of the circle to serve on the board. Dr. Gaines initially declined the invitation and said, I'm, look, I'm retired. I wanna enjoy myself. I don't just wanna get involved in anything like this. But there just so happened to be an exhibit at the Arkansas State uh, Museum on Rogelyn Johnson. I introduced myself again. And I said, I was the guy that Mr. Sims talked about. And he said, well, let me think about it. And so, Dr. Gaines consulted with Reverend Ota about serving on the board. Dr. Gaines said, well, I'll, I'll agree to it if you'll serve with me. And so both Dr. Gaines and Reverend Ota became board members. This would actually prove very pivotal later on in our story. November 1st, 2013. So after reviewing the application, rereading it over and over and making sure that I did not miss anything or get anything wrong, I filed the documentation to incorporate the VAMAC and at the same time filed for the construction permit for KLEK. And right there, what you're looking at is a copy of the articles of incorporation for the VAMAC. So I had to wait 30 days to see if anybody else would apply for the frequency. Basically, there were two available frequencies in Jonesboro. I applied for 102.5. The FCC released the list of applications and thank the Lord that ours was the only one that applied. Reason why that's important, if some other group had applied for 102.5, then we and that group would have had to, at first try to voluntarily come up with some kind of solution to share the station or maybe one of us may potentially drop out. We, we'd have to try to work something out. And then if, the, if, if we could not, the FCC would step in and apply a point system to assign who got the station at what time. So usually in situations like that, and you saw that happen a lot in the country, especially in Los Angeles, where you had like, I think like 21 people apply for the only frequency that were available. So it was good that we didn't have to negotiate with anyone. We had it all to ourselves. The only thing that we had to do from that point, it just focus on trying to get the thing going. But still was one little problem. The wait. So while once the FCC released the list of the applicants, I had to wait 30 days. We're doing this 30 days. Anybody could basically file an objection. Any individual, one of the other radio stations around town, anybody could file an objection. And depending on their reason for objection, application could be rejected. A surprise while eating Chinese food. So you'll see during this presentation some of my Headlines, I tried to make them a little bit interesting. So one day in Helena, I believe it was February 3rd, I thought I had the date on here. I'm sitting down at my favorite Chinese restaurant in Helena, West Helena, where I'm from. I'm, I'm talking with this lady who has a son who's a rapper and wants some air, some radio airplay. And I subscribe to this company called Rec Networks, which provides consulting services for radio stations. And they were actually tracking the FCC applications. They actually had like some kind of tool that would automatically notify status of applications. So at 11.20 AM, I look down on my phone and I see the following tweet. LPA Film app for the voice of Arkansas Minority Advocacy Council, Jonesboro, Arkansas has been granted. That was probably one of the happiest days of my life. But it was also the moment when it got real. I'm like, okay, I've got, a, I've got a permit now. Now I've got to actually get to work to get this thing built. Getting to work, the early days on Stone Street. So now that I've got the construction permit, now I've got to get equipment, got to get software, got to get music. And of course, I got to raise money. Starting off, I had a one room office at 1218 Stone Street. The room number was 204. And back then it was just myself and one other person. My very first volunteer, Ryan Anderson, he was an intern from Little Rock that was sent to me from A State. So for hours each day, I would work on the R&B, getting it tagged and prepared, and Ryan would work on the gospel. And there's a picture of the very first Kaylee K Studio, 1218 Stone Street. So what's in the name? So I've 
many of you may be familiar with how KLEK got its name, but I'm gonna go a little bit more in depth into it. So the callers are a radio station. They're not just the legal name of the station, but they also establish the station's identity. I always knew I wanted either to call it as KLEK, and that's for stations that are west of the Mississippi, or if I had gotten a station east of the Mississippi, it would have been WLEK. But before I could get them, I would actually have to apply and just hope that no one else had those callers. Well, luckily, no radio station actually had KLEK, but the U.S. Coast Guard actually reserves some frequency, some excuse me, call letters for some of their ships. And sure enough, there was actually a ship with the call sign KLEK. But what you could do is you could actually petition the Coast Guard, and if they hadn't used it or abandoned it, then they would release it to you. So luckily for me, the Coast Guard wasn't using that signal, and they released it to me. And that's what you see on this slide here. It's basically the letters stating that they are the Coast Guard is releasing KLEK for us to use it. All right, so bringing it to my mom. So as I mentioned earlier, the first K is because our station is west of the Mississippi, and the LEK is for Lovey Edmund Kale. So anyone who knows me knows the influence that my mother had. I mean, my mother raised me as a single mother. My mom and dad had cancer at the same time in 1990. He had prostate cancer, she had breast cancer. He would pass away, but she would go on to raise me. So she is the one that is responsible for me being the person I am today. So I always wanted to honor her in some way. And so using those call letters is basically how I do that. Now, if you see the picture on here, this is this is actually the portrait that hangs in the studio. Anyone who's ever been to the, to the studio has seen this. I actually had this um, commission. And the funny story behind it is the artist that commissioned it was a little bit nervous because she said, I've never actually painted a Black person before. And the, per the picture that I gave her, mom did not even have on any makeup. But, she's, but I said, when I looked at it, first I broke down and cried. And then I was like, you actually nailed mom's makeup. That is actually how she wore it. She said, well, I thought about it. And when I thought of your mother, I thought of royalty. So that's why I did the glow with the, with, with the, with the yellow around her head and the purple dress. All right, so let's talk about moving day. Ran into a little bit of a hiccup. So obviously when you're looking for office space, first thing they're gonna ask you is, well, what are you gonna do with it? So imagine going to different places and say, well, I'm, I need some office space, but hey, by the way, I need to build a 47 foot radio tower. Can I do this? A lot of people told me no. But the property management at, on Stone Street, at first they said I could. Now this is important because when you fill out that FCC application, you have to put specifically where you're gonna build that tower because there's engineering that goes into it. You can't just do it. There have been stations that have done it and they got caught and they got fined. So, I always would stress it's important. Can I get this tower on this property? But the owner of the building decided, nah, I don't want a tower on my property. So now I've got to start all over. Got to find a new location and refile the application. So middle of the night, rented a U-Haul van, packed it up and headed to 1411 Franklin Street. And have been there ever since. But I was a little bit smarter this time. I actually got where I could build the tower, put in writing. All right, going public. No turning back now. June 7th, 2014. This would be a watershed moment in Kaylee K's history. I was feeling so many emotions because I know the moment that I hit send to make that Facebook post saying that Kaylee K was coming, that was it. People were going to watch to see if I succeeded or failed. So this is what I read. This is what I posted. As I contemplated on how I would make this announcement, so many things came to my mind along with so many emotions. A part of me was really nervous about starting such a bold and uncharted venture. Then it was revealed to me the words of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Take the first step in faith. You don't have to see the whole staircase. Just take the first step. And from there, I announced that Kaylee K would be coming to Jonesboro. The Fab Four. So these are the first volunteers at KLEK. I mentioned earlier, Ryan Anderson, the first volunteer, he's on the far right. Brandon Tabor and Allie Hooks, they actually both inquired about volunteering for KLEK. They actually both inquired a day apart and they were signed a day apart. And 
we would spend the next few months going around Jonesboro, canvassing, trying to get support for KLK. So a quick little story, as you see on here, Brandon and Allie would actually fall in love and, and they are currently engaged to be married. So I'm gonna tell that story right quick. So one day the four of us were in the studio and Allie asked me, Laganzi, I'm hungry. Can I buy us something to eat? And Brandon was like, girl, if you buy something to eat, I'll marry you. So the four of us, we, we, we're we nerds. We're kind of goofy like that. So we actually staged this fake wedding. And so we fake married Brandon and Allie together. And they decided to be, as, as the younger people say, extra with it. So they were going around calling each other all these pet names, especially related to Little Debbie Cakes and all the little different Little Debbie snacks, which I can't remember for some reason. But they were so over the top with their affection toward each other, they actually fell in love for real. And, and I just can't wait to tell that story at their wedding. All right, so our very first underwriter, our very first sponsor on June 2014, Presley's Drive-In became the very first underwriting on KLEK and they sponsored the Wake Up Jonesboro Morning Show. That was the morning show that I originally did for the first 11 months of KLEK's history. NJ and I, the North Jonesboro Neighborhood Initiative, I can't stress enough how many great relationships that I made being a member of NJ and I. But NJ and I was a group of citizens that were dedicated to improving life in North Jonesboro. The group was led by Emma Agnew. And all of us, the four of us, we actually signed up to become members of NJ and I. We would come to the meetings and we would volunteer. And we, again, we met so many people that formed so many great relationships that helped us even to this day. All right, so we hit a brick wall. So after months of going around asking people to support, asking people to give money, we were down to the last 12,000 and we just couldn't get a penny more. You know, just couldn't do it. People who already were donating were starting to get frustrated like, well, we gave you this money, but there's no station. Is, is this real? Is this a scam? So the pressure was starting to mount. So at our November 18, 2014 board meeting, Dr. Gaines suggested that we get a bank loan to finish construction of KLEK. Angels to the rescue. To help ensure that KLEK would get the needed financing, Dr. Gaines and Reverend Ota actually personally guaranteed the loan, which we got from Centennial Bank. And I know both of them, Hate me to tell the story, and I know uh, Reverend Oates is going to kill me at church this Sunday, so uh, y'all said an extra prayer for me. But it, I'm going to just forever say this. It, it really means a lot. you know. And that's one of the things that I have learned this year. God has put so many people in my life that in, not just believed in me, but they actually put themselves on the line for me. They you know, put their name, their reputation, their credit, anything on the line. Just own a young kid from Helena, Arkansas, who dared to have a dream. So, but because of them, we were able to get the financing and we did actually pay the loan off on time in 2018. So now we've got the money, we've ordered the equipment. We've actually set a launch date of January 1st, 2015. After all this big long wait, here the kid's gonna launch January 1st, 2015. But don't you just hate it when somebody doesn't return your phone call? One of the final expenses we needed was to actually build the original tower, the, the original 40 foot, 47 feet tower. The cost we, we recorded was $2,100. The contractor who we had contacted, not gonna give his name, I called him, I said, hey, we've got the money, when can you come put this tower up? Didn't return calls, didn't return texts, didn't return emails. But the clock's ticking. I've already started telling everybody this thing's going to launch January 1st, and I can't find them. So I had to scramble to find someone else. So I started calling around. I was calling all over the country. Well, most of the contractors I called were just too high. Either that or they were too far away, that, like in California or somewhere. They, they were willing to come do it, but you know they wouldn't be able to get there in time or they wanted to charge too much money. But I finally found Wallace Tower Specialists. Their, their price was a little bit more over budget at $2,800, so the board did have to approve that. But once approved, they said, hey, we can be here on January, December 22nd, 2014, and they came and put the tower up. So those are some pictures of them building the antenna in the, in the office, erecting the middle picture of them erecting the sections and attaching the antennas to the tower sections. So construction finished. Now it's time to see if it actually works. So 
one of the things that I never really just told people throughout the journey was with low power FM, because the signal isn't as strong as your traditional radio station, you're not hundred percent sure how good it's gonna actually work until you turn it on. It, the engineering is at best a guess. It's a pretty educated guess, but you can turn it on and the signal may not be strong enough to even get a couple blocks down the road. So there was a potential, this thing could get turned on and I'm ruined before it even get launched. That was a cold and rainy day. With the construction finished, it was time to turn the transmitter on. I was so anxious. I called home. I told Pam, I said, Pam, it's done. I've turned it on. See what you can get. She went out to her car. She turned on. She said, baby, it's loud and clear. We both broke down. And I'm almost breaking down just thinking about it because if, if I'm not going to embarrass her, but she'll tell you that uh, those few months while I'm trying to get this thing going, it was a, definitely a stressful time for our family. All right, so now that we know that it works, countdown to launch. So as you see on our website, which Brandon Tabor built, had the countdown timer on there. We would kind of turn the transmitter on and off periodically, kind of give people a little sneak peeks of the station. And one of the times we, we actually turned it on all day Christmas and played Christmas music. But basically, we were just counting down to the moment in which we would officially go on the air. And that is actually our launch flyer saying launched at midnight, January 1st, 2015. So at the strike of midnight, January 1st, 2015, we officially launched. And I was going to actually include the recording of our very first broadcast, but I wasn't able to get it in time for this presentation. But I do remember saying, and I'm paraphrasing, with the faith of a grain of mustard seed. I, re I remember saying that. And that's what it basically all about. I kept that tiny bit of mustard seed faith that this thing could be accomplished. And here we were. January 12th, 2015, we got our license from the FCC. So the way that it works is once you actually finish building the station, you actually file for what's called your license to cover. And your license to cover, it covers your construction permit and gives you your official authority and license to broadcast on the air. So on January 12, 2015, Jonesboro officially had its first licensed radio station owned and operated by African-Americans. That, that may be on a trivia question one day. So once we got on the air, we quickly experienced growth. We actually reached our 50th underwriter and sponsor with New Wave Wireless and Ebony Expression on September 19, 2015. So the station was pretty well received. I mean, people were really happy that we were here. Serving the community, which is what KLEK is all about. Now we kind of get into how K we've gotten, it, we started with the history of Black radio a little bit, some of the history of how KLEK got started. Now we're gonna kind of talk about how KLEK began to impact the community. So since launching KLEK, we've been involved with over 50 local community organizations. These are civic organizations, nonprofits, fraternities, sororities, student organizations, churches, all kinds of organizations. And we would DJ for them. We'd offer sound equipment, technical support, or just volunteer with any programs that they got going. And that was very important one, to get us established in the community, for us to be visible in the community, but also to help us to shine a spotlight on what they're doing. It goes back to the title of this presentation, Building Bridges and Building Communities. And I got that from my FCC attorney, Michael Richards, and I told him that I, I, when he told me that, I said, I'm going to forever use that. So Michael, thank you for that. The Arkansas Community Service Award the community and the state and the nation take notice. So in 2016, I was nominated for the Arkansas Community Service Award by Emma Agnew. Uh, because of winning the award, I was recognized by Arkansas Governor Asa Hutchinson, uh, both U.S. Senators for Arkansas, John Bozeman and Tom Cotton, Congressman Rick Crawford, and a citation by the Arkansas Senate given by then Senator John Cooper. And as you see, I'm pictured with Governor Hutchinson with my award. This was broadcast all over statewide TV. It made national news. So now people are like, 
well, if he got this award, they must be doing something down there. So that I credit was a one of the big launching pads of people starting to know, hey, KLEK is serious because even though we launched it, there were some people that think, well, they're not gonna last long, or they're not really serious. We'll, we'll, we'll see if they're for real, but this actually kind of helped to prove it was for real. Hail to the chief. One of the most enduring and beneficial relationships I've made during this KLEK journey is the one with Jonesboro Police Chief Rick Elliott. So Chief Elliott took over at JPD in September 2014. And one of the first things that he wanted to do was to help repair the relationship between the police department and the black community. Jonesboro had just not long before that had his own incident with the Chavis Carter situation. So there was still a lot of tension from that. So Chief Elliott would go to black churches and speak, trying to get to know the black community. And one Saturday, he just went to the mall and he was just there greeting and shaking hands. And I just went up to him and said, Chief, I'm, I'm gonna start the first black radio station. Will you do an interview? He said, absolutely. So when I launched, I hit Chief up and said, hey, are you ready to come on? And he came on and he enjoyed it so much. He said, so when am I coming back? So ever since Chief Elliott comes on the first Wednesday of each month and it has done a lot to help bridge the gap in the black community. And it's been beneficial to JPD as well because of the PSAs that we air for JPD or with Chief Elliott coming on. We have other officers come on as well. It has done a lot to increase the diversity of the Jonesboro Police Department. In fact, they have one class that was over 50% people of color. And that's very important because with all of the talk of police brutality, defund the police, whatever you want to call it, to have that relationship to where the police department is slowly starting to look more like the community it serves. That's very important. I'm a firm believer in being the change in which you seek. Can Christians have fun? I know a lot of you are gonna scratch your head at why did I put that? I'm about to tell you. One of our longest running shows on KLK, and we just actually did an episode this morning, is our Wednesday morning Bible study, which still airs to this day. This was actually Reverend Ota's brainchild. The original purpose was to start a 15 minute morning Bible study and hope that another church would take it over and sponsor it. Well, <laughs> that other church never came. What did happen was it would become a platform for me to ask questions related to faith-based topics in which the audience would share similar questions. And that is where the topic came from because one of our Bible study topics was, can Christians have fun? One episode of our Bible study actually went worldwide. It went viral. It was shared over 80,000 times and was very popular in Nigeria. And you can see there, that's kind of like a screen get grab of one of the first episodes of our Bible study. But that's definitely one of the things that I'm very proud of that we do here at KLEK. The property code debate. KLEK establishes a reputation as community service. So in 2016, the city of Jonesboro attempted to pass a property maintenance code. This code was very controversial. A lot of people did not want it and there were signatures gathered and a recall election was actually put in place. During all of this time, we went back and forth interviewing the proponents and the opponents of the property maintenance code and we even hosted some debates. This is when people, again, kind of started noticing, hey, KLEK is where people go if you want to hear both sides or all sides of the issue in depth, not just a one or two minute sound bite, but long form interviews up to an hour where you can really get a feel for how each side is feeling. And with unbiased coverage, I tell people all the time, I believe our listeners are intelligent. I don't have to steer them one way or the other. They can make up their minds, excuse me, for themselves. A tale of two judge positions. In March, 2016, there were two district court positions for Craig Cay County voters to, to decide on. There were four candidates that ran, including the incumbent judge. So. I'm sure many of you are familiar with the situation with the Justice Network. If not, the Justice Network was this for-profit probation and parole company that a lot of people in Jonesboro were getting caught up in. They were owing a lot of back fines and were going to jail over it. Not just people of color, I mean, everyone was getting caught up in it. And so basically it was the hot button issue of the campaign. Three of the four candidates, the only one that actually was for it was the incumbent judge who actually put into place, but all the other three candidates campaign against it. So Judge David Bowling and Judge Tommy Fowler ultimately won those elections. And again, those interviews that we had with them actually reached over 100,000 people at home. 
Facebook. And immediately after they took office, Judges Bowling and Fowler, they put in an amnesty program and they partnered with KLEK to get the word out. And thousands of people actually were able to get their fines walked away. In fact, Judge Fowler invited me to come sit in court one day and observe. Now, I will never forget, there was this one lady who had all of these fines and had warrants for arrest, but she was a veteran. And when Judge Fowler looked at her service record, he simply said to her, ma'am, go home. Thank you for your service. Your record is wiped clean. So just kind of another story of how Kaylee Kate was able to help facilitate something that did a lot of good in the community. Community Conversations, laying the groundwork to become a true community hub. Community Conversations is our daily community talk show and we have our host, Kabila Jones on. And I'm just so proud of Kabila. Kabila is such an amazing person. And if anyone has ever interviewed, been interviewed by her, you'll know why. We started the show in July, 2016. Originally, Kabila and I hosted it together, but I always told us, uh, I'm gonna hand this off to you one day because I'm, I'm too busy trying to keep this thing going. And sure enough, I eventually handed it off to her and she has truly made it her own. And over the course of hundreds of episodes, we've had so many people for so many organizations, people making a difference that have been on there. But this show is the centerpiece of our community outreach and it goes to the heart of our identity. The first National Bank Tower, a game changer. So even before we launched, I always knew KLK was going to eventually need a taller tower. We could, we could have built a 100-foot tower at launch, but we had two problems. One, it was going to cost over 25000 which obviously we didn't have, as we talked about earlier. And we would have had to get the FAA involved because the station is so close to the Jonesboro Airport, which could have delayed the, the launch for several months, <coughs> excuse me, even up to a year. So our engineer basically said, build a tower at 47 feet, get it on the air, then you can apply to get your taller tower later. So that was always in the back of my mind. So during the fall 2017 interview, then Mayor Harold Perrin asked how he could help KLEK and I showed him my funding prospectus, which had different projects on there um, that we wanted funded to help grow KLEK. And he paid particular attention to the tower project. So Mayor Perrin um, recommended to First National Bank that they sponsor this project and First National Bank agreed. And of course, some of you may remember that day when they did the press conference and they brought the big check. I know that was definitely a day that was very special to me. And so because First National Bank did that, they got naming rights to the tower. So if you ever tune in to KLK at the top of the hour, you'll hear broadcasting from the First National Bank Tower. This is KLK LP Jonesboro. And because of First National Bank making this happen, we got an additional average of five miles in signal total, and our signal got stronger in the city of Jonesboro. Team Jonesboro versus Citizens Tax Enough. Team Jonesboro was an initiative by local citizens to raise a one cent sales tax to pay for police and fire and quality of life projects. While a lot of people supported it, a lot of people were also against it. The thing is, the people that are against it, they didn't have as much coverage as the people that were for it. And so we actually were the ones to give them a platform. Now, again, we weren't playing sides. Again, talking about that disclaimer earlier, but we did give both sides the opportunity. And we were the only place in town where you could actually see a debate between Team Jonesboro and Citizens Tax Enough. In addition to that, we were also streaming different town halls that they had. When we had that, debate it was at that time our most watched live stream of anything we had ever done on KLK. But as I'm sure most of you all know, the team Jonesboro vote failed. But it only failed by like I think 211 votes. So that's another lesson. Every vote counts. Don't ever miss the opportunity to vote. Does Jonesboro really need an MLK street? For many years various groups tried unsuccessfully to get a street in Jonesboro named after Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. In 2019, the Craighead County NAACP petitioned the Jonesboro City Council to rename Johnson Avenue after Dr. King, but this met a lot of resistance. A committee was established to study the best possible solution, and KLEK, we were at every one of those community meetings streaming those meetings so that the citizens could be informed of how those negotiations, how those discussions were going as the committee came up with their recommendation. And of course, as you know, the committee ultimately recommended that Commerce Drive be renamed to Dr. MLK Boulevard and for a Freedom Trail 
to be constructed. The council would pass this and MLK Drive, I mean, Boulevard was, I mean, Drive, I see on the side, I got Boulevard on there. Um, we, brought, we actually broadcast and live streamed the unveiling of the MLK holiday. And that was a moment I was very proud of. So technically to answer the question, yes, we do need an MLK Street and I am glad that we have that. And I'm glad that Kaylee K was able to be along for that and to play a small role in helping to get make that happen. Black Lives Matter. The George Floyd protest, protests of 2020 were a tenth time in the country. Jonesboro would feel the effects as protests began to break out. It was to the point where Mayor Perrin called me and said, I need to get in the studio. I need to, I need to talk to the community. That's how concerned he was. So he came in and he spoke to the community. And not long after that, a, local, a group of local teenagers actually organized a protest in which thousands of people came and I went live stream it. I was the one of the only media there that whole day. We completely shattered our streaming records. As you see from the picture, over 3,200 people watch it. I remember Trey Stafford from Jonesboro Radio Group contact me and said, hey, Laganzi, I shared your feed. I hope you didn't mind. I didn't mind at all. It increased our uh, likes by 1,000. But on a serious note, being there in the middle of that history was something else. But again, it was tense because there was a moment during that protest in which the realization that I am a Black man in America today hit me. It was a little later on in the day, there was some ancillary protests going on. Jonesboro police, by this point, they're on full ride gear. It's a line of them in their shields. And it's just me standing in front of them holding the phone in their face. And it's a whole group of protesters behind me. I'm trying my best not to cry on the air. But people can hear, and I can even feel in my voice right now, just the tension. So people in my phone text me like, look, it's, it's going to be okay. We're praying for you. And these are pe people in prominent positions in the City, I won't reveal any names, but that actually meant a lot to me. And during the protest, Chief Elliott and uh, some of the other leaders in the community spoke. But th then that's just kind of another example of how we were present in the community. So some takeaway lessons as, I, as we near the end of the presentation. Serve the community and the community will serve you. I'm very firm believer in that. When you focus on serving people, and I'm currently doing leadership at Jonesboro, and this is actually being reinforced in the training that we're doing. Uh, so I'm gonna see if I can actually get this right. So Jim, if I get it wrong, don't get bad at me. So it's, it's purpose, people, pace, perception, profit. And of course, uh, Reverend Oates said that money is the lowest ever blessing. If you focus on serving people, everything else will fall in place. Be present wherever possible. So if you notice some of the examples of some of the events that I covered, that was the thing, be present, be in the community. If there's something going on, I can't make everything, but if I can make it, I really try to make a good work effort to make it. And I think people can really develop an appreciation for that. Allow each side to tell their story, especially those who may not have any other outlet to do so. Don't interject your own opinion into it again, just allow people to tell the stories and let people decide. I think that has been a, a major key to KLEK's success. And of course, be thankful. And I thank God for all of this, because I know without God, none of this would have been possible for the kids from Helena, Arkansas to do what we've done with KLEK. KLEK is a family. I always say, I can't do this thing called KLEK without you. To me, you is everyone who thought of us, prayed for us, shared a post, listened to the station, told others about us, volunteered for us, donated to us, or sponsored us. You all make it possible. And I've got a video I'm going to share. I may need to, I'm going to stop my share just for a moment because I'm not sure if I actually enabled uh, sharing audio, screen broadcasting. Uh, share content, screen, start podcast, microphone on. So hopefully y'all can hear this. All right. Uh, uh, hey, uh, well, we're getting low on time. I was going to show our family matters. Um, video. So let me go back to my last slide of the 
presentation. So how can you support KLEK? Spread the word. You can download our app, search KLEK in your app store. You can follow us on all social media, search KLEK FM or KLEK 102.5 FM. You can volunteer. If you want to donate, these are the different ways you can donate online, which is our website, klekfm.org. You can click the green donate button. You can mail or drop off a check, 1411 Franklin Street, Jonesboro, Arkansas 72401 <clears throat> via PayPal, A-M-A-C, K-L-E-K at gmail.com. Cash app, dollar sign K-L-E-K-F-M. K-L-E-K-F-M on Venmo, or you can text the keyword K-L-E-K, the number one to 44321 takes a donate. All donations are tax deductible. We are a 501c3 nonprofit via the Voice of Arkansas Minority Advocacy Council. Again, thank you all so much. I enjoy speaking with you. I enjoy um, this bringing this to you. And I hope that each and every one of you enjoyed my presentation. So I will stop screen sharing. I should have did this from my laptop, but I'm trying to do it from my iPad. And I will throw it back to Amanda. Thank you, Leganzi. That was some fantastic information. What just a great um, story of how an A-State grad created this, this great KLEK radio station and it serves our community so well. Um, we did have some questions submitted. I don't know that we'll have time to get to all of them because we don't have that much time left today, but I am gonna um, give you one and it kind of combined it into two. Um, it's social media is having a major impact on information delivery. Do you feel this has or it will have a positive or negative impact on radio? And then kind of a tie into that is, you know, how do you feel like the high tech multimedia world is impacting radio? Well, it absolutely has impacted radio. You know, now it's not just radio TV, it's multimedia. In fact, the program at A-State is called, you know, multimedia journalism communication. So today's media outlets, no matter if it's a radio station, a television station, online, encompasses social media, live streaming, video. If you only just focus on that one thing, you know, you're already behind. It has changed things um, as far as like how people get their information. And of course, like with things such as how, even how people listen to their music. But one of the things about Black radio, a, a lot of African-Americans still like to listen to radio in their car. Um, but like I said, the it has had an impact. One of the biggest ways it's had impact is now it's, now even though we are non-commercial, we still have to try to get money. We still have to approach businesses about sponsoring, just like commercial stations approach business for advertising. Well, now you've got social media where you can buy ads on social media. So now you are kind of operating in this entire ecosystem. So to sum it up, you have to adapt to stay relevant. Absolutely. And one other quick one. Um, somebody submitted, how should students connect with you about internships and jobs at KLEK? They can contact us, go on our website, klekfm.org. There is a link to where you can fill out the form to volunteer. Um, as far as getting an internship, just talk to uh, your internship coordinator in whatever department you are in at a state. And I always tell students, even if you can't come in as an intern where you get credit, still volunteer because it'll still be great for your resume. Mm -hmm. um, I think we can do one more too. What has been your biggest challenge working in radio broadcast in the Jonesboro community? And how would you, what's some advice you would give to anyone that aspires to do something unique or different like this in their own communities? Well, the biggest challenge is, you know, our finding volunteers and of course especially with COVID-19 that, that you add that on top of it and also getting donors and sponsors you know uh, everyone has a budget you know it, there's only so much money to go around and there's even other nonprofits. and each of these nonprofits are also doing great work in the community so you know you can only support so many so you know people think because it's nonprofit doesn't mean any money you still have to compete in the marketplace I mean the rules of engagement are just a little bit different. Now, as far as what advice I can give, it, 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 has, it has to be your purpose and your passion. Um, if you're doing this just to be doing something, you won't survive. So if you want to get into this, make sure, 
make sure there's something that you're really passionate about. Do your research, do your homework, and don't be afraid to take a risk and don't be afraid to fail. I think that's great advice. And it's obvious we can all see the passion that you have for what you're doing. Uh, we appreciate what you do for the communities um, and the way that you're giving back and making a difference. We, we are very proud of that at A-State and we thank you for that, Leganzi. Um, I just wanna say thank you to everyone for joining us for this Lunch and Learn. Um, I'm Amanda McDaniel with the Alumni Association. I'm the Director of Affinity Relations. If you guys have any suggestions of things you'd like to hear or be talked about or who you'd like to hear from on these Lunch and Learns, feel free to submit it to me. It's amcdaniel at astate.edu. We'd love to hear your suggestions and ideas. Um, the next one we do have planned coming up is in two weeks. It's on February 24th. That will be another Wednesday at noon. And that's going to be with Latasha Moore. She's a 2014 A-State graduate. She's got degrees in communication studies and world languages. And she has started her own business called Tasha Teaches Spanish. She's received several entrepreneurial awards. And we're very excited to have her speaking about entrepreneurship um, on our next one. Can I just interject one quick second? Absolutely. Tasha actually does a segment on KLEK, Tasha Teaches Spanish. It's a one, one minute um, segment that teaches Spanish. So we kind of got a little bit of tie in and I will be on her session as well. Looking forward to it. Well, and I'm loving to see all of these A-State grads working together. Um, I think that just shows kind of the relationship that you build when you're on the campus at Arkansas State. You make these connections and it, it serves you later in life for sure. So thanks again, Lakenzi. We really appreciate you being here with us today for Black History Month. And we'll see you guys in a couple of weeks on the 24th. Thanks for joining us. Thank you all again.